And now a man who really needs no introduction because he's been here every year, Jack Dangerman. Thanks, Katie. See you. Hello. With me is my colleague, Jeremy. Um, he is uh, an interesting guy, as you'll find out in just a minute. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, making this thing happen, Brady, and also this conference. Uh, let's give a round of applause to all of the O'Reilly organization. It's good. And uh, thanks to Shirley, free beer. That's very good. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about realizing spatial intelligence on the GeoWeb. So it's a mouthful, or translated a little differently, geographic knowledge that's created inside of GIS available to Web 2.0 users. ESRI is a software company or a technology company, or better described as a GIS company, and we focus primarily on technologies and GI science, like the stuff that uh, Greg was showing. It's just a fantastic presentation, by the way. Um, and also primarily on our users. Our users over the years have cr contributed lots of knowledge to the GeoWeb. In fact, many of you are using it, and some of it was shown actually this morning. Um, their contributions are enormous uh, in terms of base maps and thematic data sets. And I guess what we want to talk about largely is how some of their stuff is being integrated more directly. But I want to start with a couple of definitions. First, what is geographic knowledge and how does it really relate? This diagram, kind of in a simple cartoon, makes it clear. A lot of what drives GIS users, and, and also you, is the integration of geographic knowledge into human ha action. And by using it in various ways, it can make a huge difference, as we've seen. The evidence is very clear that it not only impacts business and governing, but it also is making a more sustainable world. I want to go now to the definition of geographic knowledge. So it's more than just data. It's data, yes, but it's also the data models that structure the data, like classification systems and ontologies. It's the data. It's also models and analytic environments, like, uh, for example, like Greg showed, that show predictions or processes or suitability interpretations where many layers of data are combined and weighted and interpreted. Fourth kind of knowledge is cartographic knowledge. And many of you have experienced bad maps uh, and also really great maps, maps that tell wonderful stories. And part of geographic knowledge is encapsulating that cartographic expression, that kind of thing that cartographers do, like color ramps or symbology sets, uh, and sharing it as encapsulated knowledge. A fifth kind of GIS or geographic knowledge is workflows, like I do this before I do that. And planners do that, or zoning people do that a lot. Foresters do that. It's geospatial workflows. And that is being captured and shareable. And finally, metadata, which describes the other five. And metadata is actually extremely important because it is the key for discovery or access. I mean, I search and I find it. I point to distributed geographic knowledge and, and access it. These GIS technologies are, I would assert to you, and you really know, changing things. They're changing things first in terms of how we abstract our world. Those five or six kinds of knowledge are examples of that. Second, it's changing how we, as human beings, reason. And this is true both in the professional world but also in the broader societal world. It's introducing spatially integrated thinking. People are beginning to think about relationships between this and that, relationships between disease and environmental situations that may support it. Or people are asking the question, if I locate this here, what are the consequences of it? And the good work of Google and others in getting people spatially aware, I think, is, has consequences beyond simply looking at interesting maps. It's causing them to do spatially integrated thinking. And we're right in the midst of that today. The third thing is it's changing how we organize between different agencies and organizations and communicate. It's over here and over there. The language is changing. And that's all about a shared 
geographic database and the web 2.0 environment. And, and again, I would assert that this is actually changing and introducing a new approach for problem solving and thinking. GIS, these tools that I work with, are implemented in three basic patterns, the desktop, the server, and increasingly in federated networks where multiple servers are blended together, orchestrated, mashed up like that to create integrated knowledge. A fourth pattern is emerging, the web GIS or the um, GeoWeb, and this involves authors authoring knowledge, those six types, putting them onto servers and serving it out, and then being able to directly have it accessed from different sorts of devices. Web GIS is kind of like mainframe GIS was 40 years ago, but a different platform, or mini computer GIS was 30 years ago, or workstation GIS was 20 years ago, or PC and client server GIS was 10 years ago. It's a different platform, and it's harnessing the knowledge of GIS practitioners with the incredible capabilities of the Web2 environment in shared common resources. And I would say it's just beginning. It's, it's going to go way beyond simply visualization and mapping. It's going to embrace all types of that knowledge and ultimately become a kind of societal infrastructure for human behavior or human action. The heart of this is Web 2.0 GIS servers or geo servers, and they make geographic knowledge directly available for mashing up and integration. People author the knowledge, they drag and drop it on a server, and then it's accessible in other desktops or in browsers or in cell phones or in, in through open standards to virtually anything, and also integrated into, into enterprise environments. And, and again, I'll just simply emphasize the fundamental difference between this world and the worlds that I've experienced in GIS before is the web is the platform and it is creating, trans, transforming is the right word, access to this knowledge base, making it orders and orders of magnitude more available and usable and collaborative. So the GIS user community is basically supporting this notion of transforming their data sets into services. And those services, published services, can be mashed up with other web services in all sorts of forms, using JavaScript inside of browsers, inside of geo-browsers, inside of mobile phones, and uh, making it available for, for a whole new community to leverage uh, that other community. So uh, rather than talk about this, I think it's better just to look at a series of demos. And Jeremy and I have put a few together. This first one is a project that we did with the Gates Foundation in Africa, and it looks to locating market centers for agricultural production. It runs a complex model um, predicting and incorporating all kinds of layers of data, like how do I move across geography, or across terrain, walking, carrying food, across road networks, in trucks, on bicycles, and it also incorporates layers of agri agricultural productivity or, or land use. And the result is a kind of accessibility map. It takes a, a few seconds to run this, but you can see this complex contoured polygon on top of a base map service that's coming in from another server. So this is an example of geospatial analytic modeling running as a service and uh, being able to be simply mashed up in this simple application. But behind the scenes, there's some interesting things at work. You want to cover that, yeah, Jeremy? Sure, Jack, thanks. Well, that's a nice little application, uh, but it's not just about the application. Like Jack said, it's about the services that are behind the application. And if I look here, I'll see this RESTful call that I made uh, that I'm calling executing something, just basically calling a URL. But if I copy this uh, input, uh, maybe spend a little bit of time talking about what this service is that we actually called. This is the uh, services directory for ArcGIS server. Uh, and this is the HTML view of the service that we just called. So this talks about how you would use it, how you would develop against it. It's not an end user view, but it's a developer view. Uh, I see I have a couple of parameters. I have an input location parameter. That's basically where I touched on the map. And that gives me an output, this travel time stats output. I can take this output, I can put it in a table, I can draw it on the map, I can do whatever. So I could go and execute this model, I could paste in my point. Uh, but what's interesting now 
is I could get the results back as HTML if I was a developer. Uh, I could get the results back as JSON, JavaScript object notation, if I wanted to develop an application against it, or I could go ahead and get the results back as KML. I've gone ahead and executed it already, uh, and that KML is just gonna open right up into Google Earth. And what's kind of neat about this is that this model is not, this geographic knowledge, this model is not tied to a particular application, but is open for every, any kind of application to use. That's very interesting. Well, how would I find, for example, that model or the service that supports that model? Well, let's take a look, Jack. Um, so good. <laughs> good. <laughs> good way to uh, find things, really, is to go to go to Google. I might just type in something, like maybe I'm interested in the city of Greeley, Colorado, and I want to find map services there. Boom, the first thing I get is a series of map services that are available. I can look down and see that, ah, here's this planimetric service. It gives me some service level metadata about it. I have some tools where I can open it up in different clients, uh, but I can go ahead and get more detail about this service. Oops. Ah, and this is that services directory view. But instead of being that model that we were just looking at, this is this map service that I can look at. And if we go ahead and view the map service, we'll see that it's a very beautiful map. It's got great cartography, great data actually here. You see this LIDAR data in the background, very detailed information. Uh, but if we go back to Google Maps, Jack, where'd you go to school? <laughs> Sit. Lastly, Boston. Lastly, Boston. All right, that's good. Well, let's just uh, see what's around there. Again, I just typed in Boston uh, in Map Server, and I found all these map services that I can I can look at. I see uh, aerial uh, service, and again, I get that simple metadata. I can go and drill into this server, see what else they have. So this is a aerial uh, an aerial map service. Uh, if I go back and maybe see what other maps they have, well, they have quite a few maps here. I'll see census information, parcel information, planimetrics, terrain, and so on. But it's not just about maps. If we go and see what else they have, they have more than just maps. They might have uh, locator services, so things to be able to geocode or find uh, your location with the, with the data of the city of Boston. Also tools. In this case, this is a, this is a tool similar to this uh, market tool that we showed before, but for solar Boston to calculate rooftop um, solar potential. Well, the city of uh, Boston builds these services so that they can build applications against them. In this case, this is an application that the city of Boston put together uh, to illustrate um, solar potential in the city of Boston. So here's these yellow dots tell me what uh, existing solar panels are already there. But we wanna, the city wants to encourage people to see what would happen if they put more uh, solar collectors. So I see, and I see that very nice uh, base map, but I've got a set of tools here. So in this case, I can calculate the solar potential on one of these buildings. Pretty nice. That gives me the information about what, how much I'd actually get if I put solar panels on my roof through uh, January through December. This but is this is a JavaScript. A jo uh, no, a flex. This is a flex application. Flex application. Actually. That okay. first one was a JavaScript. So they they had lower level services, dozens of them, and they built a flex application out of it. But you can access both the services, and you can. Well, what? Exactly. Well, you out there might be thinking, oh, great, City of Boston just put up this application and all the data and the services are hidden behind it. No, that's not the case at all. Again, if I open up Firebug and take a look at the bottom, I'll see I've made a call to a query operation. This is this JSON view, but let's make it something a little more uh, readable. And this is the, the HTML representation of this query. And I get back the information that I needed to make that graph. So you might go on and build your own application. I went ahead and built this and built another application using a Silverlight map control. I've got virtual earth base maps, uh, aerial and street imagery, and I'll go ahead and zoom to an area. And I'm going to actually just call that same tool, uh, but again within my own application. This is just another way to show you that these services are open. They're out there for you to use and for the users of uh, the city of Boston. Yeah, the, the point that I want to get across here is there are now tens of thousands of these servers, GIS servers that are out there. They're building data sets, maps, models, and they're open and accessible. And you can search Google and find those services and mash them up and do, or build your own applications like this Silverlight application. Um, I want to show one last thing, and this is this is a website that uh, was built by the state of Maryland called StateStat. This is uh, under the direction of uh, a guy called uh, Governor O'Malley. 
And uh, he came up with this idea of city stat and state stat, which is trying to expose government's spend for citizens to get involved with. Uh, so on this existing site, this is sort of the phase one that he put out a few months ago, I can point at a county and I can find out how much stimulus money is being spent by my government in my county. Kind of interesting. I want to, though, show you phase two, which is currently in development. It'll be out in about uh, two or three weeks. And it's actually a template that's being used now by many states. Those little green circles are how much money is being spent, stimulus funds, that's the overall amount of money. And then I can also uh, look at different categories of spend, for example, for education or for uh, uh, health care or different things like that across the top. I can also type in my address and zoom to a particular place, my, my, my house, and see what the spend by category is around my house and see very specific projects that are being funded under the, this is your money, by the way. <laughs> you know, being funded by the stimulus funds and actually point at one, like here's a local school, they're going to spend $30,000 doing ABC. And then I can open up a window and give comment about it. In other words, give feedback on bridge to nowhere or that sort of vision. You get this idea? I mean, this is a very powerful idea about having government open up not just their GIS data, but I'm talking about their data using web mapping as a framework to make government more transparent and more accessible and a new chapter of democracy opening up. If you look at the lower left-hand corner, it shows with this tab where the money's being spent. But that's not enough. In addition, I can tab it to need. So this is a hotspot analysis model that's showing, in this case, uh, where there's low need and high need for average grade score, based on average grade scores, so I can compare where they're spending money geospatially versus where they really need to spend money. And if I move over a little bit further, I can look at performance. Like uh, over a three-year period, did grades, math grade scores go up or did they go down? And I want to share this example because I think this is an opportunity for you, uh, particularly this community, to get engaged, uh, build these sorts of websites that open up government, looking at the financial dimension of, of where we're making investments as well as where we need to make investments. And when I show this to political people, they, well, they get nervous and they also get very excited. When I, uh, people like OMB Watch, uh, NGOs, those kind of organizations get very excited because suddenly they can look at government transparency and accountability, all those things that in this administration, uh, uh, national administration, there's a lot of attention being given to. Well, let me summarize uh, two main points. First, I wanted to get across the, own, the notion that GIS servers are now integrating knowledge. You now know about geospatial knowledge. It's not just data. It's models. It's analytics. It's cartography with the GeoWeb. And they're easy, and they're standards-based, and they're collaborative and will not, will leverage what I estimate as billions of dollars of investment by the GIS community. This is a good thing. Um, and also, these servers provide a good, for some of you, these servers provide a good platform for building applications for the GeoWeb. Second, um, WebGIS, this environment that all of us are engaged in in one form or the other, promises to extend the whole vision of e-government. Sometimes I like to call it G-government because <laughs> it's uh, all about a geographic or map framework for making more transparent government's policies. And uh, th this, is a, this is a good and healthy thing. Thank you very much. I appreciate the chance, uh, Brady and, and others, to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack.